young boys that took up that offer, and I thank you very much. Y'all done a fine job. <laughs> I said, young boys, not elderly men. <laughs> All right, y'all. Are we ready, buddy? Today we're going to begin in Matthew 24, 21. All of you watching on TV, come visit with us at Antioch and Edgerly. 1030, Sunday morning, we'd love to have you. And today, here we go in Matthew 24, 21. Then, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Father, please open our eyes. Open America's eyes that they could see this great time of trouble is right around the corner. All the signs have been fulfilled. All the prophecies are finished. And Father, it's time for this to begin. Help us to prepare ourselves and to be ready to meet you in the air. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And everybody be seated. You know, Jesus warns us. And folks, I know some of you are probably saying, Boy, Brother Russell, you sure preach on that a lot. Folks, it's the day we're living in. We've got to get prepared. We've got to get our loved ones prepared. This Bible said there is a great tribulation. You know, you stop and think about the things this world has seen. We've seen the Black Plague, 600,000 people died. We've seen the Civil War, 600,035 people died. You know, I mean, look at what cancer has done. Look what Adolf Hitler did. The Bible said all them things are nothing. Nothing compared to what's coming. And I'm to tell you, folks, when God finally gets a belly full, all these gay movements now, boy, that's the thing. And if you're not in with it, you know, right now we're having a controversy in Florida. The teachers are teaching children that, well, you might already check, you might be gay. And they're talking to kindergarten students, putting this junk in their heads. Well, the governor's saying, hey, I'm not going to let this happen. And, boy, they're making him look like a monster. Well, folks, we need to understand we're living in the last days. And this Bible said when people get so wicked and they forget God and they don't want him no more, and that's where we are now. They're trying their best to get God out of America, and they're doing it. This Bible said God is going to pull the Christians out of this world, and he's going to say, okay, Satan, they wanted you. They got you. And I'm just going to throw this in. The Ukraine... They hated Trump, and they wanted Biden. They got what they asked for. And I'm going to tell you something, folks, in America. America thinks they want the devil. No, they just don't know what they're asking for. And this is exactly what this is saying. And you know something? And when you shall hear of wars, in, Matthew, in, in Mark 13, 7, and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must need be. But the end is not yet. Folks, right now, that is what this is talking about. We've got wars and we've got rumors of wars. But then it goes a step further. For a nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Stop right there. You know what? Nation against nation is Germany and America. Kingdom against kingdom is Russia and the Ukraine because it's the same people. It's the same people. And they're killing each other and they're fighting. These are signs in the Bible. And just like the wars and the rumors of the wars and kingdom against kingdom, right here in America, right here, We've got people burning cities to the ground because we've already got our civil war started here. You know, I was looking at the news the other day, and over in the Ukraine, man, they are destroying that place. The enemy has come in, and they, they just destroyed that beautiful place. And it's amazing because here in America, our enemy is within. We're burning our cities. We're killing our people. We're destroying our towns, but we're doing it. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. This Bible is the Word of God. And all these things that you're seeing right now is in this book. Wars and rumors of wars and nations shall rise against nations. You know, folks, you can look in your Bible and see there's Russia, China, and Iran. And the Bible clearly says those three are going to rise up and they're going to go after Israel they're going to wreak havoc all the way until they get there. And that's exactly what you see in today. You see where Iran bombed our embassy, embassy in Iraq yesterday. This stuff is in the Bible. It's in your newspaper. It's on the news if you watch the news that tells the truth. And you will see all of these things that are coming. As this goes on, 
There shall be earthquakes in diverse places. You know, folks, we're having earthquakes now where they never had them before. We're having volcanoes right now erupting and just covering towns and countrysides with lava. These are signs. God is doing this to make us wake up and get ready for what's coming. Diverse places. That means places they don't normally have. There shall be famines and troubles. Folks, go to the supermarket. You can't find nothing on the shelves no more. Man, I went yesterday and several things that I, I like to get, they don't exist anymore. I mean, not on our shelves. And there's troubles and there's beginning. This is the beginning of sorrows. This is not the tribulation. This is beginning of sorrows to warn you, to get you right. Because you see, folks, as I just said, they've taken crafty counsel. The UN, as far as I'm concerned, they need to do away with that mess. We're paying billions of dollars to them. For what? To gang up on Israel. That's all they do. And the last time they had a big UN meeting, they got in there and they discussed and that how they could get rid of Israel. Why are we paying them people to go against God's chosen? Well, that's wrong. In Psalms 83.3, they have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. You know... Israel, they're hiding over there in that little old bitty nation. They don't bother nobody. They don't do anything to nobody. They ship food all over the world that nobody else can grow. But yet, they're hated. Why would people way over there in Russia and China and Ahmadinejad and all that, why do they hate them so much? Well, let me tell you why. It's God's people. Why do they hate Christians so much? Because we're God's people. He's the, the devil. He's the God of this world. Don't ever, don't ever make mistake of not understanding that. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may, may be no more in remembrance. You know, folks, this blows my mind when I read that. Not too many years ago, Iran had a president, prime minister, whatever you want to call the dictator, Ahmadinejad. And he got up at the UN meeting and he said these exact same words. Come. Let us wipe Israel off the face of the earth that they'll no longer be remembered as a nation. He said that. And everybody, oh, they just got up and they cheered. If you don't realize we're living in the last days, man, you're going to be caught with your pants down. God has given us every warning that he can give us to get yourself right with him because he's coming back. And this world, as you know it, is about to change like your imagination can't fathom. Man, it's in the Bible. You know, in Psalms 83, 5, For they have consulted together with one consent, and they are confederate against thee. You know what? When you look at the world today, they're all in cahoots. They're all in agreements. Even your news media. You can watch the lying propaganda media, and every channel they say the same thing word for word. They go word for word because they're all in cahoots. They're all in uh, confederate they're together on this deal really it's true folks you know <clears throat> God's had a belly full people don't realize it but when you look at Sodom and Gomorrah when you look at the great flood and so many other things God does get enough I know he's a merciful loving God and he'll forgive you as long as you ask him to but there comes a time when people can society can cross the line and, folks, we crossed it a long time ago. I heard a preacher say a while back that if God don't do something with America, he better apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah because we're worse than they ever thought about being. But you know what, folks? Listen good in Revelation 16.1. And I heard a voice out of the temple of God saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of wrath of God upon the earth. Folks, you and I can't imagine what that even means. Go pour out the vials, the buckets of the wrath and the anger of God upon ungodly people. You know, I know we've had some hurricanes and we've had some earthquakes. and We've had mudslides and forests burning. And Lord, there's so many things that's happened. None of those things are the wrath of God. That's just Mother Nature. We're about to experience the wrath. Now, I say we, and I shouldn't say that, because if you're saved, you're not going to experience it. You see, 
you got to understand something. Never in the Bible did God punish the good with the wicked. If you remember when he punished Egypt, man, it was darkness over the land. But the Israelis, they had light in their houses. Egyptians could light a candle and it would make light. And you know, just all the other stuff through the flies and the the fleas, and that didn't go to the Israelis. It only went to the bad people. Well, let me read you something about you. In First Thessalonians 5, that, For God hath not appointed you, I'm talking to save people, to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, folks, we're not here to experience the, the roughness of God. We're here to experience the love of God. Is any of you... Would, would, would you want to torture your children and make them hate you? No, and God don't either. God wants to bless his children. But some on this earth are not his children, and they already hate him. But you see, that's the ones that's going to feel the wrath of God. So, folks, every time I talk about this topic, someone says, Oh, don't, don't talk about it, Brother Russell. It scares me. Then you need to get saved. Because if you're born again, if you are saved, you will not see this tribulation period. And we will all be called up together to meet Jesus. First Thessalonians 4.13 I wouldn't have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you saw or not as others that have no hope. You know, folks, I know we've had loved ones that passed away and they've gone on before us. Jesus said, I don't want you sorrowing and grieving over that. You've got to understand, we're all leaving here to gather up there. It's just like saying, well, y'all, uh, I'm going to leave this evening and bring the groceries out to the island, and uh, Trav's going to come tonight, and he's going to bring some chickens. We're going to barbecue them. And, uh, and, and Kevin's come with all the bait and the rod and reels, and we're going to all meet on the island. Boy, we're going to have us a camping trip. Well, you look forward to that. Well, God says, hey, I'm fixing to come get you. Some of them of you are coming meeting me now. But I'm going to come get the rest of you, and boy, we're going to have a ball. And that's what it's about. And we shouldn't fear this, folks. This is God telling us that he's getting ready to come get us. Don't be afraid like people that have no hope. Don't act like you lost your daddy and you're never going to see him again. That is not the case. You and I are born again, and this life right here is nothing but a training ground for a life eternal that is so wonderful. Oh, if you could ever get there, if you could ever be to heaven for one second, you'd never want to leave. But it's so hard to go to heaven. You've got to be perfect, and you've got to go to church every Sunday. That's what the devil wants you to believe. But let me read you the fact from Jesus' mouth, and this is what it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them that are asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. You know what, folks? Even the ones that are in the graveyard, they're already with God. But we're going to come back through the graveyard or through the sea or your ashes, and you're going to be reconstituted. What's the purpose of that? To show the devil he did not win nothing. He might have put you in the graveyard. He might have buried you at sea. They may have burned you and got your ashes in an urn. But, folks, they're not going to stay in that urn. And you're not going to stay in the ground. And the sea is not going to hold them down. Because when Jesus comes back and they blow that trumpet, bah, ah, man, people's going to start coming up out of the dirt and out of the ocean. And we're going to have brand new bodies. We're going to go meet Jesus in the clouds. And that's when it's going to be over with, folks. This world is going to see. They want the devil. They're just about to get him. Because... If we believe Jesus died and rose and you confess that with your mouth, that goes without saying. Even so, them that are dead, that's what that means, because they don't die. Jesus, God, will bring with him. That's talking about the rapture. Listen, verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Folks, this ain't somebody's opinion. This is in the Bible. That we which are alive and remain of the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. We're not going to go first, and I'll tell you why. Because we're going to witness the graves busting open and everybody coming out with a brand new heavenly body. God wants you to see the devil has been destroyed. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, 
With the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, we're going to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in there, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. You know what people tell me? Well, that word rapture is not even in the Bible. That's super stupid. First of all, the word rapture is in the Bible because it's a Greek word, and the Bible was written in Greek. Raptur means to be caught up or pulled out. Well, naturally, it's not rapture here because this is the English Bible. So it's translated, and there's the word caught up together. It is in the Bible. But not only the word, but the whole event. How do you explain this away? What was Jesus talking about when he said, I'm going to come back and get you and call you off the earth and you're going to be with me? How do you explain that to be anything else? The event is in the Bible. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord and scare each other with these words? No, wherefore comfort one another with these words. This rapture, this tribulation should be a comfort to you. Well, how can a tribulation be a comfort? Because it proves this Bible you believe in is real. It not only told you what was going to happen thousands of years ago, and it did, but it's telling you what's about to happen in our lifetime, and it's going to. This is the word of God. And Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you behind, and I'm not going to let you go through nothing that you can't handle and horrible. And it's, You're my children, and you're not here to feel my wrath. You're here to feel my love. And we got to remember that, folks. Behold, I show you a mystery in 1 Corinthians 15:51. I'm going to show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. You know, folks, you can't go to heaven in that fleshly body. You'd be up there sweating and stinking up everything. God don't want you up there like that. God's got a brand new body for you that don't age. It don't get fat. Woo, hallelujah. It don't get sick. And it lives forever. You don't even have to sleep. <clears throat> in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at that last trumpet, for that trumpet's going to sound, and the dead shall rise incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Folks, I am looking forward to that day. But you know what you and I need to be doing right now? We need to be watching. And what does that mean? Well, it means you need to be in church every Sunday hearing the Word. It means you need to read your Bible every night before you go to bed. Read your Bible. Get up in the morning. You know, folks, you don't have to read five chapters before you go to work, get up and read one verse of Scripture just to chase the devil out of your mind for the day. And, of course, it don't hurt to sing to yourself if you're by yourself on the way to work. Ain't nobody knows what you sound like when you're in the car with the windows rolled up. Now, people might pass you on there and say, look at that nut talking to himself. That might happen. But you know what? I believe in prayer. And I believe in talking to God all day long. And I do. I talk to God all day long. <laughs> but listen. Listen in Luke 21, 36. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you might be accounted, accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. Folks, I know the world's telling you he ain't coming back. I know the world's teaching the kids we evolved from monkeys and God didn't even create us. I know all that stuff is going on. And the Bible said in the last days scoffers would come. And folks, I know we're in the last days because we got a plethora of scoffers. They're all over the place talking about there ain't no God and another origin of life and blah, blah, blah. Aliens brought us here and dropped us off. Y'all didn't know that? That's some kind of ore they needed. So they brought us. Once we got all the ore, they just left us here. Them scoundrels. Well, I hope you don't believe any of that. I hope you know that God created you and he loves you more than all of that propaganda they can st stomach to give us. <laughs> it's 2 Peter 3, 3, knowing this first. This is something you need to know, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning to the creation. They said, well, when is he? I, I had a guy told me this not long ago. I was doing a Bible study at a facility, and a guy come up to me, and he's in waggy, he said, yeah, when's he coming back? Real cocky. 
And I said, well, I have no idea when he's coming back. But I know the Bible says he is, so therefore he will be coming back. I don't put a date on it because I don't know. But I can look around and like Jesus said, when you see a black cloud coming, don't you see it's going to rain? Shame on you. You can tell the signs of the sky, but you can't read your Bible and see there's a storm coming, folks. You better be in the shelter. Well, 2 Peter 3, 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of children of God? No, ungodly men. We're fixing to see a heat hit this earth like you ain't never imagined. And it's going to burn up the very elements. But this is not for you. This is for ungodly people. 2 Peter 3.8 proceeds. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is like a thousand years, and a thousand years, it's like one day. See, you, don't, you might say, well, he's been gone 2,000 years. That's like one day to God, two days to God. But what we don't understand, he's given us a chance to be saved. What if he had come 1,500 years instead of 2,000? You and I wouldn't have got a chance to be saved. And that's what he's doing, just giving us time. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But listen to this. But is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's it, folks. God might be waiting on you to get saved. God might be waiting on one of your relatives to get saved. And then he's going to say, well, that looks like that's the last one. Let me go bring them home now. And he's going to come blow that trumpet, and you and I are going to meet him in the clouds, and then he's going to say, Satan, it's all yours. <whistles> Man. 2 Peter 3.10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, when the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Folks, that's a nuclear war. You know, when the Bible was written, there was nothing that could have done this. There wasn't even a thing called a fervent heat back in the Bible times. That's why it says in the last days, you'd recognize these things. Because, see, now you and I know a fervent heat is a nuclear bomb that didn't exist 100 years ago. Seeing then that all these things are going to be dissolved, what manner of person should you be with all holy conversation and godliness? You know, folks? That's flat out. How should you be living knowing that this is coming? You should be in church. You should be reading your Bible. You should have a prayer life. Slack off the bad things that you know God's not pleased with. We're not going to be perfect. We're not going to be sinless. But God don't look at that. He looks at how hard you try to be perfect. He looks at the effort that you put forth to be sinless. He don't expect perfection. He just expects you to be like him and try to do what's right. Well, in 2 Peter 3.13, Nevertheless, we, according to the promise, you know what? We look for new heavens and a new earth wherein delighteth righteousness. You know something? I'm not scared. Uh, he's going to burn up everything because you know why? He's going to build a brand new earth. And he's going to build a brand new atmosphere around this earth. And everything's going to be beautiful. It's going to be the Garden of Eden again. And so, folks... Stop worrying about the signs and get right with God. The old saying goes like this. If you're going to pray, don't worry. And if you're going to worry, don't bother to pray. But you know something? Jesus don't want you to be scared. And he's trying to tell us all the time, all this is going on for us. Here we're afraid of it, but it's all for us. In John 14, 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I'm going now to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. When Jesus left this world, he said, just as I predicted, everything else, including me coming back from the dead, I'm leaving now, 
but I am coming back. And I'm going to take you to where I live. Now, I'm going to make you a mansion. I'm going to build you an estate. It's going to have your name on the mailbox. And there's a driveway made of gold driving right up to your house. And you're going to have wings like eagles. And you're never going to be tired. And you're just not going to believe it when you step on that street of gold and walk through them pearly gates. How you're going to feel and look and what you're going to have for future. God says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I live, that's going to be your humble abode for eternity. You know, folks, that is so wonderful. But first, you've got to make sure you're saved. I didn't say religious. I didn't say a good Baptist or good Catholic. Or, you've got to be saved. And that don't include religion at all. The thief on a cross had no religion, but he called him Lord. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You know, <coughs> This guy had to believe because he heard about the kingdom and he believed in all that. And now he's asking Jesus, I want to go with you. And Jesus looked over and said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Folks, you don't have to be religious. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to belong to an organization. But you have to have a relationship with Jesus. You have to ask him to come into your heart and be your Lord. You've got to say out loud, I believe you died on the cross. I know you rose from the dead. Save me. You can lay your head on your pillow tonight. You can kneel down beside your bed tonight. Or you could be in a shower full of soap and say, Lord, I believe you died on the cross. I know you rose from the dead because you're God. Save me and wash my sins away. And this Bible said he saved uh, Zacchaeus in a sycamore tree. He saved the thief hanging on the cross. He saved many more of them on the ground and the town couldn't even get up. He'll save you wherever you talk to him. But you know all these things folks were scared of and blah, blah, blah. But here's the answer. The whole answer in Luke 12, 31. But seek ye the kingdom of God. And all these things will be added to you. Don't worry about nothing. Just seek the kingdom of God and get saved. And the eternal life you get with it. The happiness you get with it. The abundant life comes with it. It's a total package. And the eternal life in heaven, it's all part of it. Don't be fretting the tribulation. Don't be worrying about hell. Instead, be prepared to go to the place that Jesus has prepared for you. And use your time here to get your loved ones saved. Stop being afraid. Let's go to work. Just like Moses. Moses standing there and there's the Red Sea and the Egyptians are coming and the Hebrews are all crying. Moses, what are you doing? And Moses is praying. And you know what the Lord said? Strangest thing. Hey, shut up with the praying, man, and let's get across the sea. Actually told him that. Why are you still praying, man? Hold up the stick and part the sea and get across. Well, sometimes, folks, you and I need to put the action to the prayer. Amen? Start living like you believe it. Start acting like you know it's true. That's what this is telling us. Luke 12, 32. Fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Folks, Stop being afraid and start realizing God is preparing us for a home in heaven with all of our loved ones. You know what? You're not going to know how to act when you walk up the pearly gates and your mom and daddy passed away. Maybe a brother or a sister, maybe even a child. But when you walk up there and your husband or your wife is at them pearly gates glowing like the sun, you're just not going to know how to handle yourself. It's kind of like John. He said, when I seen it, I just fell down like a dead man. My legs became jello. I was in such awe. Well, folks, be ready for that. It's God's to give you his kingdom. That's his pleasure. But this world, that's a different situation. They're partying. They're getting drunk. And they're not worried about God. They're not worried about him coming back. They're worried about their favorite movie star and the Kardashians, the Kardashians and their favorite athlete that can't read and write. That's what they're worried about in America today. But what they need to be worrying about is where does your soul stand? 
1 Thessalonians 5, 3 says, when the people, the lost people, when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. These people think everything's getting better and it's going to be all right. Well, they're going to find out it's not going to be all right. And you know something? They're not going to escape. But then again, but you, brethren, you are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You hear that, folks? Nobody knows when he's coming. Well, you don't know the hour and the day. But this Bible is very clear. This coming again is not going to overtake you. You're going to be watching for it. You're going to be expecting it. Why? Because he gave us a million signs to let us know to be prepared. But you know what? When this does happen, the Antichrist is going to take over this earth. People can't imagine how horrible it's going to be. But in Revelation, look what it says, 13, 17. And that no man might buy or sell except him that has that mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Folks, in this world, you're going to have to take three sixes. Of course, I see young people now with on necklaces, on earrings. I see them with shirts and 666 on the back. And some say I'm a child of Satan, and they're very proud of that. But, uh, you know, I have my right mind, so that don't appeal to me. But you know what? He's going to offer you three sixes. Without them three sixes, you can't work and you can't buy anything. And you just don't realize you're ostracized from society. Then many, many will take it. And the punishment for that is eternity in a burning hell. So you want to go into rapture. You don't want to be left behind to take the six. Listen. Revelation 14, 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast or his image, or receive his mark in their forehead or in their hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. Man, oh man, you know, pour it out without mixture. It ain't nothing, they're not going to cut it with nothing. It's going to be full strength. What a horrible thing that's going to be. You know, it says some will receive the mark in their palm of their hand, others in the forehead. There's two theories on that. Dark complected people, you couldn't see a tattoo on their forehead, so they'll get it in their hand. But then there's another theory which I agree with. During Adolf Hitler's time, there was people that took the three sixes in his case, in his case, because they believed in him. They took the Nazi symbol because they believed in him. And when this happens, there'll be some that's going to take it in the head because they believe in it. But then there's going to be others that say, I, I got to have some groceries. And they're going to take it in the hand because I got to have a job. I, I've got to go along with this. Uh, take me by the hand. That's what that means. Some are going to believe in him, just like Hitler. There was a many, many German that cried themselves to sleep at night for what Hitler was doing to the Jews. But then there was others that, ah, yeah. you know, that's just how that is. It's going to be that way again. And the smoke of their torment is set up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night that worship the beast in his image. And whosoever received the mark of his name. Folks, it's going to get so bad during that tribulation period. You know, I know that our dignitaries, see, they're not worried because they got strategic places all over America like NORAD in, in, in uh, Colorado. They've taken a granite mountain and they bored a hole in it nine miles into the ground. Nine miles into a granite mountain. They built a city. I've been there. They built a city under there. All our dignitaries are going to run get under them rocks when the bombs start falling and the elements start melting with fervent heat. And listen to what the Bible says about these guys. In Revelation 6, 16, And they said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. You know what, folks? That's what's going to happen. They're going to get in that mountain and think that it's going to protect them and it's going to fall on them. There's no getting away from the wrath of God. Except through Jesus Christ. In Revelation 6, 17 proceeds, For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? Well, that's a question I put forth to you this morning. When this happens, 
Who's going to be able to stand? Well, let me read you the answer right here in 2 Samuel 22, 2. He said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my what? My deliverer. God's going to deliver us from this tribulation period. And it goes on in Psalms 9, 12. I will say, I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge. He's my fortress, my God. And in him, I will trust. Folks, I don't know how lost people sleep at night. With all the bombs pointed at us, with all the new diseases popping up every day, with all the enemies we got all around the world. Here in America, you can't even get on a subway without some nut pushing you in front of it. Look at what's going on. But you know what? I'm going to tell you all the truth. I sleep real good at night because this don't bother me. If they blow up the world tonight, I'll wake up in heaven tomorrow. That's how I look at it. And listen to what the Bible says in Psalms 4, 8. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only makest me to dwell in safety. Only one way you can have confidence and security. Only one way you can have peace and safety. And that's to be under the blood of the Lamb. I know people don't want Jesus today. They think he's strict and he's hard. But listen here in Matthew eleven twenty eight: 28. Come unto me, all you that are worried and you tossing and turning all night, laboring or heavy laden, I'll give you rest. You know something? I know when you hear me say it all the time. Heart attacks and cancer, they're all stress-related. High blood pressure and sugar diabetes, it's because we're all just worried and stressed out from the pressures of the world. Jesus said, come to me. And I'll give you rest from all them problems. You know, we do have a lot of problems that we must contend with, but there's a lot of problems we are not even be worried about. Give it to the Lord and let him take it away. You know, folks, but the main problem we got is people not being saved. That's the only problem we got. <clears throat> there's only one enemy. It's not your neighbor. It's not your mother-in-law. It's the devil. And with Jesus, he can eliminate that too. You know, folks, I, I tell you, when I got saved, that's the best thing ever happened to me. And I've had a lot of things happen to me in my life, and nothing compares to being saved. And I honestly tell you this, I've been saved for 30 years now, and I ain't never regretted it one time. I regret not doing it sooner. But I don't regret being a child of God, because I'm happy now. Oh, man, when I was lost, I wasn't happy. I was like an old stray dog just running around waiting for a car to run over me. But I'll tell you what, right now I'm happy. And God's given me everything I could want. God's blessed me. He'll do the same thing for you. And the best part is, I'm never going to die. Amen. And I'm not going to be separated from my family. Oh, for a little while. Yeah, we got to go to the funeral home. But God said, don't you worry about that, because I'm going to put all that back together one day. I'm going to put it all back together, and it's going to be better than it was here. I hope today you're saved. If not, I'm right here. During the invitation, come let me show you how to get saved. I've already told you, you might just want to fold your hands tonight as you go to sleep and say, Jesus, save me. I do that anyway. I've been saved, and I still tell him. I still ask him. I mean, you can't do it too much. It don't hurt nothing. But today, i got to tell you, we're living in the last days, folks. I'm not putting a time on it because I don't know. I'm just saying, better be safe than sorry. Let's be ready. Amen. Let's pray. Father in glory, once again, we thank you for your beautiful word. Oh, Father, it's such confidence and it's such a relief and rest to our soul and our mind. But, Father, today I pray if there's one here that's never been saved, they'd come talk with me right now. That they'd get their life right with you and get their soul prepared to meet you in the air. Father, we thank you for your word that we can always go to it and find out what we need to know and how to be prepared. Now bless us, Father. We praise you and we love you and we thank you for Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus. Everyone.